Three, two, this is live now. I know, because the sound things are going up and down. <laughs> Hello, my name's Russell Lolliker. I am of the Upsell, if you check me out there. But what I'm really doing here is representing Social Media Camp 20... See, I couldn't do this last time where the pointing was. It's all reversed engineered. There's something over... There you go. Anyway, I am representing Social Media Camp 2019. We are uh, doing a big one this year. It's the 10th year and bringing back some pretty amazing faces, like the one that's... Over, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I can't do the reverse thing. <laughs> Sam Fiorella is in the house right beside my face. That's the man with the glasses and the much prettier looking beard today. So thanks for bringing that up, Sam. I think so. <laughs> Sam is a chief strategy officer, a partner at SenseiMarketing.com, author, professor, and mental health advocate, which we're going to really dive into as part of this conversation. We're already getting hearts. People are watching us. I love this. You have any questions? As we go through, uh, please don't hesitate. This is a Facebook Live for a reason. It's engagement back and forth between me, between Sam, whatever. Well, obviously, Sam's the star, so we want to hear more about what he's going to be doing when he comes to social media camp. And that's where I want to start, because I, I know a lot of the topics I want to explore today. But the thing I want to start with is this will be your it's third. It's engagement. Ooh, why am I getting echo? Did I just get an echo? I did. I did. I apologize. That is weird. See, it's just, it's live. Things happen when you go live. Okay. Mm, weird. Anyway, moving along. Social Media Camp. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. We're all on the floor laughing. Pre I haven't seen RLFL in ever, so I appreciate that. Appreciate that. So, Social Media Camp, coming up in April. This will be your third time coming back. And Sam, what is bringing you back? You've been here before. What? Why are you doing it again? Uh, well, besides the fact that I love... Um, <laughs> I love Victoria, B.C. That, that has a lot to do with it. Uh, it's one of the greatest uh, cities in the country, I think. Um, but the, the reality is I've stayed away for a little while. I, I've been coming back, but I've stepped out of the social media conference, social media speaking for quite a while. Four years ago, um, when I lost my son to depression, I basically gave up all of that. I wanted to focus on my family. I wanted to focus on me. And I started uh, focusing on mental health awareness uh, for students. And so a lot of the speaking that I did was all around mental health. Um, and so it's one of the reasons why I stayed away from all conferences, not oh. just this one for quite a while. But now things have happened. Uh, the, there's been a sort of a, a convergence of worlds for me. Uh, this research that I'm doing in mental health, uh, specifically with students, is now converging with the social media work that I do with my company, you know, Sensei Marketing, right. uh, and for my clients, and I'm starting to realize there's a lot of intersects between the way we as marketers have to market in social media because of what's happening to the public, and the way that this whole tribalism thing that's happening, um, and this negativity, and the trolling, and how that's affecting consumers, and I'm seeing that there's a lot of parallels between depression and anxiety that's happening in teens because of social media and the general public because of social media. And so all of these things have sort of converged for me, and I am now uh, working on, um, I'm working on a couple of books right now, but one of them that I'm working on is The Effects of Tribalism. And so that's why I'm coming back, because now I have something that I'm passionate about, uh, and that fits with the theme of the conference. So give me one example, because the, the new book you have that's recently come out, 100 Misfits, uh, I want to get the whole name here, uh, Honest Mental Illness Stories from Students for Parents. I want to dig into that title a bit more. But before we do that, new book, new way of looking at how social and marketing and, and mental illness converge. What is some of, like, give me two sort of trends or linkages that you're seeing that inspire you to sort of go in this direction. Uh, yeah, well, the concept of tribalism, first and foremost, sure. um, it's the, the world is really becoming an us versus them. Uh, this is something that has always been the case. It's, it's never been any different. Uh, of course, social media, though, has um, created an environment where they're actually manufacturing severe uh, or extreme tribalism because you get rewarded based on likes and, you know, and uh, the number of people that follow you and this whole thing about influencers. So you're, you're basically incentivized into negative behavior and you're rewarded, you know, different parts of your brain are triggered um, when you're rewarded and 
the reality is on social media, you're more rewarded with negative behavior and severe words like hate, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to kill you, I, you know what I mean, you're an idiot, all of these types of words get bigger play and that then again creates these negative reinforcements. So I'm noticing that as well in the tribalism that's happening with kids um, and the, the amount of time that they spend online. So that's one of the big linkages I see, the amount of time and this concept of tribalism and how social media platforms are forcing us down that path to become more different as opposed to being more the same or coming together. So as a professor, uh, you are you are one of those. Uh, you've maybe and maybe that's where the the inspiration for the book came to a little bit. I mean, you're coming from it from a, an advocate of education, and you're also doing it almost from an advocate from a student perspective of telling their mental illness stories. Where right. and I'm I'm sort of reaching here is 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 that sort of where it came from in, in the inspiration of you saw these students not being heard. Yeah, uh, well, yes and no. Uh, so just two quick things. First sure. off, for clarification, the book has not been released yet. Oh. Um, it, it isn't finished. Spoiler, it's to spoiler. be released. Sure. It's not a secret, uh, so everybody knows it's coming out. Um, but the inspiration uh, for it is, is, is not really me as a professor. Um, it's really more me as a parent who lost a child. And I've been traveling the country with... Uh, our not-for-profit, the Friendship Bench organization, and our Yellow is for Hello campaign. I've been traveling the country going into schools, which is actually why I'm here in, in Winnipeg right now, um, talking to faculty, to parents, and to students. And throughout the last four years, I've talked to thousands and thousands of kids, and they keep telling me stories um, that, in some cases, shock me. Um, but what I found in all of these stories is that there's some very common themes, um, that uh, is affecting all of our kids. And so when I talk to parents, so, you know, tomorrow night I'm doing, uh, you know, tomorrow, like, well, yeah, tomorrow I'm doing two presentations to schools, and tomorrow night I'm talking to the parents, which is typically what I do when I hit a city. And what I'm finding is when I talk to the parents, and I go, guys, this is what your kids are saying. The parents are like, what? No, right? my kids don't believe that. They don't think that. We are so out of touch with what this generation is going through, um, that that was the inspiration for the book. I feel these kids need their story told. And I figured if I, as a parent and somebody who's lost a child, tells these stories, parents will maybe more likely hear it, and students maybe will know that they're not alone, that there's other kids feeling exactly the way they are. So that's the reason that I'm compiling these stories that have been told to me by kids across Canada. What's the biggest thing you want parents and teachers to take away from all this? Mm. Well, um, <laughs> that kids are, um, that kids take, well, I, that, that, that's difficult because there's so many. If, if there's anything there, it's that kids are, in fact, different than we are. We always say, uh, oh, I, I get it. I've been there. Um, you know, I walked up hill, you know, 50 miles in the, you know, barefoot in the snow to get to school. I had it much worse than you do. We didn't. You know, I, I, I grew up the child of immigrant parents. We did not have a lot of money. We did struggle. My kids are fortunate enough to have grown up with a little bit more money, with, you know, a, a nicer house. We've had more things, but they do have it harder than we do. Because the world around them, the tech, not, not just the technology, but everything else, ha is more difficult. It's a different difficult. So what I'd like parents and, and, and teachers to, to walk away from when they read this or if they, whenever they hear me talk, it's just listen and accept what your kids are going through. Because it is completely different. It is a different world. It, it, it may not be more physically hard, but it is definitely harder than anything we went through. Fair enough. Uh, big hi to Wendy Grant for a little wave there. And uh, Debbie Sterling, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Debbie's just really reinforcing about the lack of human connection in real life. Um, not to be a sidebar, when I saw RL, I thought it was my name. I'm like, is that Russell Lollicker you're talking about? Oh, real life. I'm not good with acronyms. Uh, but she's doing her best to battle uh, that negativity and speaking openly and hearing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Listening, it's huge. It's, it's, you can't communicate if only one person's talking and the other person's not listening. That's not yeah. how communication's even defined. 
every kid even, that I talk to, even the ones that have really open and accepting parents, feel judged. And there's a guilt that they take. They, most of the kids I talk to, and this is, and this is no exaggeration, tell me that their parents' love is conditional on how well they do in school or the job that they get. You know what I mean? And that's a scary thought. I know we as parents don't want to convey that, but in our pushing them and our not accepting of what their reality is, that's what they're taking away. Damn. Damn. Uh, hi, Craig. And, uh, yeah, hi, Craig. Appreciate you uh, stepping up. Um, to continue on, and, and the reason you're in Winnipeg right now in Saskatchewan next week, I believe, um, right. you're on a tour as part of the uh, Lucas uh, Fiorella Friendship Bench. Please explain that to me, because it's, it's still digging into the mental illness uh, side of things. Yeah, yeah, it is. And this is, again, part of what's leading me back to social media camp. It's the, it's the work that I'm doing in mental health awareness and talking to students. So um, we, when, after my son uh, died, one of the things that uh, Danny Brown, Robert Clark, two friends of mine and I did is we decided to carry on Lucas's legacy. What we discovered after his death is that he... Um, he was reaching out to others who were having suicidal thoughts or who had decided to take their life or who were thinking about dropping out of school or whatever. And he was able to listen to them and help them get some help, stay in school, do whatever. We heard all of these amazing stories after he passed away. And every one of those stories started with, he just came up and said hello. So we took that concept and we said, let's keep that going. And we developed these yellow friendship benches that connect students through the URL on the bench to local uh, on-campus resources where they can get help. But the entire yellow is for hello campaign around it is designed to encourage students to talk to each other. Take a minute out of your day, sit, say hello, and that one hello can start a conversation that could save a life. So we are, every year now around Bell Let's Talk, which is coming up on January the 30th, right. we do a, a Cross Canada tour, uh, where I try and get as many benches over a week or two as possible. So we're doing nine benches this week. Um, we're going to be doing six here in Manitoba, three next week in Saskatchewan, which will take us up to 50 across this country. You got a big congratulations on those 50 benchships. Uh, benchships. I'm combining it like Benifer. Friendship benches, my apologies. Uh, Debbie saying how amazing this accomplishment is, and uh, Catherine Holmes with a big hi there. So a lot of support. I mean, this is, uh, it sounds so common sense, but it's not common, and the empathy and the compassion necessary uh, for this kind of stuff, especially in a world of social media where there are no consequences to the negative language that seems to be permeating. Uh, congratulations, that's absolutely phenomenal. And I've seen the hashtag, yellow is for hello. Hello. So that's certainly made it around. And you got a website uh, linked to that as well. Yeah, it's uh, thefriendshipbench.org or yellowisforhello.org. And what's the feedback you're getting about this initiative? Uh, it's fantastic. Quite frankly, we're, we're chasing it. Um, okay. This started off, so let's just do a couple of benches just to see. We went to Lucas's university where he was attending when we lost him. We figured let's put one or two there. Let's put one in his high school and see the reaction. The reality is we've not been able to sort of stop and think since it started. It's been fast and furious. We've got almost, I think, 75 or 85 requests in queue right now. Uh, we've got requests from the Philippines, from London, from India, from Australia, uh, the United States, uh, Spain, Portugal. They're coming in from all over the world now. They all want to be part of this movement, uh, which is fantastic. But it's also incredibly overwhelming because we're a volunteer-run group. Um, you know, So it's... We really are chasing this right now. Thanks to Craig. You just put up the uh, URL, actually, ye yellowisforhello.org. So awesome. Thanks, Craig. Hey, thanks, Craig. So is there, you're doing this presentation uh, repeatedly for Let's Talk Bell, Let's Talk, which everybody's heard of and, and, and certainly has an amazing machine behind it as well and, and great exposure. What is the biggest things you're hoping people take away? Is it, is it as simple as a hello? You know what? It can be. Um, it, it's the, the simple premise of getting off your phone. Uh, this is where we're tying it into the social media and just saying hello, looking somebody in the eye and saying, hello, I see you. That has that emotional connection, that, that human connection that we are lacking today is necessary. And it's so, it's so stark, we're finding, in people's lives and in students' lives that when somebody does it, 
they're taken aback. They're like, oh my God, somebody said hello to me. And sure. it's amazing the conversations that are starting around a simple hello. Um, so, yes, it is as simple as that, and that's what we tell students. You know, uh, feeling depressed, feeling anxious is 100% normal. Uh, not talking about it is what's not normal. Um, and so we're trying to encourage that peer-to-peer -peer conversation in hopes that that will encourage them to then go and get help because they'll feel that it's okay to ask for help, that they're not going to be ostracized or made fun of. But in line with that, and this is where we get into the parents and where it even has implications in the real world for us as marketers um, or business people or just, damn it, just humans, yeah. um, is there is a direct correlation between what is happening online and our um, fixation on social media and our mental health. Uh, study after study, you know, other scholarly studies that are happening, uh, clinical studies, as well as my own research over the last four years talking to students across the country. There is a direct relationship between social media and our mental health. In fact, one of the statistics that I'm going to share with you, one of the charts that I'm going to share when I come to uh, social media camp, is um, uh, uh, the, the rate of suicide. I've been tracking suicides uh, going back 30 to 50 years. And there was a steady decline up until about 2010. And then around 2010, we saw this hockey stick happen. And all of a sudden, the reported cases of depression and suicide just skyrocketed, and they haven't stopped going up ever since by dramatic numbers. Um, and they're back to all-time highs again. Well, what happened at that time period when they went up, all the social media uh, platforms, the big ones launched, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Snapchat. So, you know, there's other things that happened at that time period, so it isn't just that. Um, but it's fascinating to me that when social media became a thing in a big way, with, starting with Facebook, all of a sudden reported cases of depression and suicide have also started to go up at the same time. Uh, and that's what got me on this path and, and what started this latest effort, this research that I'm doing on the effects of social media on our world. Totally understand. I, I want to be surprised, but I don't, like at the same thing, it's like with such a shift in how we connect and interact with each other while being so solitary in how we're interacting on our own, even though this window we use, it's called technology. Um, I want to be surprised and I'm scared that I'm not. That's, that's the thing that's kind of, kind of hitting me a bit on that. Social Media Camp, you are coming. You have an amazing presentation. That's, it's en route. Again, I'm going to read because I've got phenomenal notes. Uh, the name of your presentation, which is Social Media Tribalism, which you've already touched on, and Society's Breaking Point. What are we getting from this? I can feel like we've been sort of laying the groundwork from this conversation to what this is. Yeah, and, and the presentation will very much be the, the, the net result of uh, the research that I've been doing. I haven't actually released it to anybody. This will be the first time that I talk publicly about the research that I've been doing and the findings that I've had uh, or that I've been able to gather over the time. But the main, I guess, gist of what uh, you'll get at this presentation is I'm going to be issuing a challenge. I'd like to start a movement, and I'd like it to happen at Social Media Camp where we as not just as marketers, I'm choosing this forum as marketers simply because this is the biggest social media conference in Canada, uh, and in my opinion, one of the best in North America, um, but also because we can lead the way. We are the ones, you know, like we marketers have been at this since, you know, uh, 2010, when, you know, Web 2.0, remember when that was a thing? When Web 2.0 came out, yeah. we sort of, we we've kind of in our adulthood grown up with this. We have a perspective and we have a profession that I believe we can start to make a change. And so I'd like to use our collective voice to say enough is enough. Society has gone to this extreme, right? Uh, this is where this, the pendulum that uh, reference is referenced in the bio, uh, bio of the, the presentation. Society has gone to this extreme where social media has trained us to be um, extreme tribals, uh, uh, tri uh, ex in extreme tribes. Um, and we now need to reset that pendulum. And that's the movement that I want to start here. I want to say enough is enough. Let's work on not exasperating that. Let's not work on leveraging the fact that, you know, tribalism exists. And we know that if we play to it, 
that we could get more sales, we can get more likes, we can do, we need to find a way to get people together again um, and get that back. So that's really what I'm hoping to do. I'll be sharing the results of my research and I'll be issuing a challenge with some steps of what we could do to hopefully bring it back. I like me some homework. I like it. I'm nice. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what's an example uh, you would say that would sort of really hit home this tribalism idea for you and, and for anybody listening and watching? Oh, um, well, I think maybe one of the biggest ways or one of the biggest examples right now is, uh, well, you can take a look at anything. Democrats versus Republicans in the United States. Red atheist blue. versus theists. Western versus Eastern medicine. Liberalism versus conservatism, Darwinism versus intelligent design. There's just so many um, ways that we sort of separate ourselves, right? And it, the way that it works, basically, if you take a look at the studies, social media platforms like Facebook, if you go ahead and join, let's say, uh, let's use the, the biggest example right now, I think, is politics and uh, what's happening in the United States. Um, so let's just use that as one example. Sure. Um, if you, for example, join a I Love Trump group, you know, the Trump train or whatever they call their, their pro-Trump uh, groups, what you're going to notice on Facebook is in your stream, all of a sudden you're going to start to get um, posts about white genocide um, and, uh, ex um, and, and conspiracy theories. So what Facebook, and it's not just Facebook, uh, Google uh, will do this, um, YouTube will do this, you will all of a sudden be pre presented with data that is going to keep you online longer because it tries to identify what is your personality, what do you like, and so it then reinforces what you've already searched for or the behaviors that you've already exhibited so that you stay online longer, yep. right? When you act like an asshat at home, in, you know, at the dinner table and your parents, you know, slap you in the back of the head, what do you do? You stop. Right, you're, you're, it's, it's the reinforcement is to stop being an asshat, not to continue being an asshat, and not that Trump supporters are asshats because this happens on the other side as well. I just that was just no, the first exactly. example that came to my head. Um, but online, it's the opposite. Online, social medias are training us to do that. Right, and again, you look at the psychology. There's something called a tweet cascade that was studied, and they studied words that were put, um, certain words, extreme words that were used in tweets versus, like, extremely negative versus extremely positive. The extremely negative words had this massive cascade of followers, of likes, of shares, of comments. The neutral or positive comments on the same topic got very little play. And so, again, because now going back to our kids and the parallel to the kids, what do they do? They are being reinforced to show negative behavior, sometimes risky behaviors, sometimes liking things that they don't even like just because they want to be part of that group. Right. It's this tribalism. So we're experiencing it. We experience it every day anyway. That's human nature yeah. to want to belong to a group, to feel like you're liked and loved. The difference is it's being manufactured in social media, and that is making it worse and is getting us to this extreme. We got Craig with a shout out to Jason. Also, Craig is voting for Ass Monkey over Ass Hat. Again, we're getting divisive already with Ass Monkey versus See? Ass Hat. That's See what I'm a saying? Meme. Everybody a meme. wants to argue. That's the thing. <laughs> so, and this is, I want to bring that up because, I mean, obviously your examples are completely true, but definitely more in the more obvious realm. What's something like the Gillette ad or something mm -hmm. like, what's the color you see in this dress? <laughs> or how do you do, which is the one I saw today, which is how do you sign an X? An you X. Do it, uh, That's an X big one. thing right now. It's incredible. I was number eight, by the way, if anybody's wondering. So <laughs> out of curiosity, how is, the, I mean, that seems very manufactured, even more so than the red versus blue state thing. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is. And I, I, you know what? The Gillette one is actually um, a fascinating one for me. Uh, I was just on CBC uh, television just this week talking about it and on CBC radio all during the week. What is fascinating to me on this one here is the divisiveness of this ad when it really shouldn't be divisive. I mean, who in society today would take a stand against men not being ass monkeys? Towards women. There so you go. Right? The ass monkey. There we go. Nicely done. Yeah. <laughs> you can use a, a sentence every day for the next month until it becomes habit. Um, so, but we did. You know, people took exception to it. Why did they take exception to it? Because they read a political message in it. They weren't looking at it as a social cause. 
as something that is good for society. It is how societal, you know, uh, mores are changing. Sure. No, no, they read it as, hold on, you've taken away my uh, my jobs, you've taken away my um, uh, my economy, you've taken away my, my rights, now you're taking away my manhood. And so they read this political message into it when it was never intended to be a political message. Right. But that's an example of how we look at everything today. We've been trained to look at everything that way. You know, and you also have to look at that it's not just natural. There's so much manufactured um, distrust and commentary out there. And I'm not talking about Facebook showing us things that reinforce our, 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 our negative biases or even our positive biases for that matter. You take a look at the troll farms out in, in, uh, in Greece, in, in Russia. You know, they're affecting the way we vote. Brexit and Trump were in large part manufactured because of offshore troll farms. So we are being manipulated and until we wrestle back control, you know, nothing is going to be safe. Worst of all, our mental health. Got a question from Chris Burge, surprisingly the co-founder of Social Media Camp. Um, Sam, wondering what level of responsibility you think Facebook and Twitter share in what's happening and what changes you would like to see them make? Yeah. Yeah, funny that Chris is on this, right? Um, <laughs> Odd. You know what? I really struggle with this one. I have to admit, uh, the capitalist in me says, "Well, they're a business. Good for them. That's not their responsibility to be responsible for our for us as human beings. That's our responsibility in our own homes." On the other side, over the last four years, I've seen firsthand the death that this has caused, uh, the anguish, and actually the death. And I'm not. That's not hyperbole. Right. Uh, I've I've seen. You have no idea that the amounts of death uh, that I've seen in the last four years, and the attempted death. Um, I do believe that they have a responsibility. If they're going to allow, first of all, they need to provide us a platform where they're telling us, this is what we're doing to you. Be aware that I am manipulating you right now. We don't allow drug companies or cigarette companies to advertise to us unless we say, you know, if you take this medication, your hair is going to fall out, your toes are going to fall off, you know, you're going to have suicidal thoughts. We make them put all these, you know, massive disclaimers on things, but we don't do that for social media. Social media has the same, if not worse, effects on us as individuals and as a society than a lot of these drugs and cigarettes do, yet we don't impose enough regulations. So they're running amok right now. And it's a business, on the business side, good for them. But as a society, and this is the challenge I want to put out to everybody at Social Media Camp, is that we can take control over this. We need to get that pendulum going back the other way. So I do believe that um, Twitter and Facebook um, have a role to play. Uh, and I think that comes with disclosure, transparency. I, we may not be able to expect them to change the way they do business, but at least be more open and transparent to let us know what they're doing to us so that we have more tools to know how to manage it um, and get the best out of the platform. I think on that note, I want to end it there. I mean, that was kind of a, like a little mic drop sort of thing. So I think uh, nothing better than to end any good chat with a challenge and a call to action. To uh, And I love that you're going to reinforce it in April, uh, I believe the 25th and the 26th, Social Media Camp. If you want to see Sam, he will be there. He'll be releasing this research, this, uh, this, this book yet to be released, uh, and some of the interest, uh, interesting nuggets he's pulled from that. So thank you so much for your time, Sam. I Great talking to you. You too, sir. And you're right. It was crappy lighting in the hotel, but you pulled it off. You look amazing. I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry about the lighting. <laughs> Oh, nobody's judging. You're good. So uh, that'll do it for this episode of our Facebook Live series for the 10th year of Social Media Camp. Uh, again, reminder, it is April 25th and 26th. There are going to be huge speakers coming back. We've got Mari Smith, Scott Stratton, and people like the Sam Fiora, Fiorella right beside my head. And I'm still doing the mirror thing wrong. Thank you for pointing correctly because I can't seem to do it on camera. Uh, again, my name is Russell Lawlicker. I'm your host. Check out the upsell customer service nerd right there. All right. Take care. Bye. All right, now we got to learn how to turn this thing off. Bun. Don't look to me. And there, finished. Oh, it still says live. Finished button's not working. End broadcast.